It's the 25th of May 1932, and you and your family are going to watch a Mickey Mouse show. We hear this distinct laugh. You know who he is in the present day, but he didn't even have a name in his first appearance. Mickey's revenue featured well-known characters of the time, like obviously Mickey Mouse, Minnie Mouse, Horace Horsecollar, and Clara Bell Cow, performing music which had become a regular trope of the Mickey Mouse short films. The character that you see before you was known as Dippy Dog according to the Disney artists, and was not part of the main cast but was a very noticeable member of the crowd because of his distinct laugh, something that would become a staple trait of Dippy Dog and his evolution as a character. The reason for why I've begun with this little historical nudge is because of how the Goofy movie honoured both the classical Disney world of Goofy and his origins, while also interpreting the world into the then contemporary early 1990s. While not including fantastical elements from the Disney world like magic, the Goofy movie was able to walk the fine line between being grounded within the goofiness of the Disney world, which does not entirely follow the laws of physics, but the grounded nature comes from the relationships and themes of the Goofy movie, which is probably the key thing that brings families back to this beloved movie. Dippy Dog was eventually named the Goof on the 11th of August 1934, after making several more appearances in other Disney shorts, but they were only minor parts. He joined the main cast with the addition of Donald Duck and Clara Cluck, while officially being named Goofy in 1939 with the release of Goofy and Wilbur. Now traditionally from the early appearances, the key characteristics of Goofy were that he was clumsy, unintelligent, but very humble. <laughs> Shown to live a simple lifestyle, but can also be described as simple-minded and quite often oblivious to the obvious or easily confused. With these characteristics, Goofy would be in undesirable situations which could also affect those around him as well. However, another key trait is Goofy's tenacity to help others. He would put himself in harm's way in order to help his friends, and has a very welcoming personality. In addition to this, he has been shown to have levels of intelligence and physical talent in other media. In terms of family, there were mentions of Goofy's family in comic books, with his nephew Gilbert, who appeared solely in the comic books. The comments that looked at his family were mainly from the 1950s in order to humanize Goofy as the everyman character, including a more human redesign. But that portrayal eventually began to lose popularity and took an effect on the amount of appearances Goofy made until he was reunited with his best friends Mickey and Donald in Mickey's Christmas Carol. A key point of the 1940s and 50s is that Goofy had become very popular and was used as a comedic character in comparison to his counterparts with an influx of his own solo shots. Now let's move to the 90s. The piece of media that looked at Goofy's family explicitly was from the 1992 series, The Goof Troop, which introduced Goofy to a new generation, which had taken influence from the previous iterations of Goofy ranging from the 1940s and 50s designs to the suburban family man, but used the humor of the comedy shots of the early 1950s, which moved away from the sophisticated versions of George Geef. He is also a single father who takes care of his son Max, who looks closer in resemblance to Goofy instead of his 1950s appearance, which pushed for more human features. The context of the 90s is also important as it holds the central theme of the Goofy movie. The pre-production of a Goofy movie started in 1993, so the years that led up to that culturally informed the movie. By contemporizing the movie, the Goofy movie team were able to add a level of relatability that Disney had not been able to reach before. And remember, this was at the beginning of the Disney Renaissance, which told stories about Atlantis and 15th and 18th century France and Mount Olympus. While they're incredible stories, they were also grounded in legends, myths, and fantasy. So as a viewer, you would have to do some form of mental arithmetic to relate to the characters. Like you can't relate to being a believed mortal whose father happens to be the King of Olympus, but you can relate to performing selfless acts for others, even if they're the smallest. Or you may not be able to relate to being incredibly talented and having to stay up in a bell tower because of physical deformities, but you can learn to not be so quick to judge others because of appearances. For the Goofy movie, just by seeing Max's room, there is already a level of relatability that Disney hadn't reached yet amongst his fans. It shows Max's interests and hobbies, and a clear admiration of Powerline. This contemporary room is then disturbed by Goofy who is exactly like fans have remembered him throughout his iterations and probably at his best. He can be considered embarrassing, simple, happy, remorseful when hurting others, and overcaring in just about a minute and nine seconds. Kevin Lima and the writers were able to show all of his qualities in such a small amount of time. Have a good day. We have our Max, and then we also have our Goofy. And now the theme of the generational gap between father and son is presented to us, and this continues throughout the movie. 
especially after finding out what could happen to Max after his stunt for Roxanne. Goofy attempts to bond with Max through things he loved growing up, like a road trip, the possum farm, dancing with the possum mascot, Okay, first of all, you're also at the possum farm. And again, Goofy Movie is ahead of its time because clearly your teeth are social distancing. And they also go fishing. This is literally the worst thing that could happen to Max, which is demonstrated to the audience in the literal first scene. When I seen the shot, it was very surreal, but I was transfixed and the colors were so bold. But then I seen Roxanne flowing and realized it had to be a dream sequence. But again, this paradise that Max wants is disturbed by Goofy but not in a literal sense, but from an internal sense. His fear of becoming goofy is his nightmare, and this becomes a motif throughout the movie. <laughs> Max becomes happy, Goofy interrupts. Max has fun, Goofy interrupts. Max wants to spend summer with Roxanne, Goofy interrupts. Max wants to go to a Powerline concert, Goofy interrupts. This changes in the last 20 minutes, which we'll discuss later, but the film after that shows and summarizes what this movie is about and what drives Max's reactions, because ultimately, as the father, Goofy makes the decisions. We can relate to the whole parents stopping us from having fun concept, but we don't have to be an anthropomorphic dog in order for this to be relatable. Kevin Lima and the writers Jim Magon and Brian Pimentel understood that much of the source material for understanding Goofy as a character were from the shots produced in the mid 20th century. So they approach this project wanting to add an emotional layer to the established character. They take the personality of Goofy and portray it in a way which is understandable and easy for people of all ages to understand. For example, as said earlier, while Goofy is a lovable character with an open heart, he also unintentionally can hurt those around him, either for pure reasons or because of his lack of situational awareness. This trait of Goofy in the film is presented in his relationship with Max. After Max is stunned to impress Roxanne, he's in obvious trouble and has a meeting with the principal over the stunt clearly not over the attempted murder. And then receives a call from the principal which exaggerates the possible outcomes of Max's behavior. Before he ends up in the electric chair. Goofy is the antagonist for Max, but to repeat, he's doing it with the best of intentions for his son. It is out of love, not spite or anger, but because he cares about Max and his lack of understanding of Max. And I think this is important because this isn't just a goofy personality trait, but something everyone can relate to as both child and parent. There can be friction because of a lack of understanding of each other, and it can continue if there is an unwillingness to understand or change. And I think that the Goofy movie is a great demonstration of character development for both father and son, and in turn both parent and child. I think that there are no true villains in the Goofy movie, but the other secondary characters help to expose traits in each other, also known as four characters. To know more about fall characters, you can watch my previous video on the Emperor's New Groove and see the importance of fall characters. I believe that a Goofy movie is a great demonstration of fall characters and their use to drive character actions and demonstrate central themes. This can be found in Pete. Someone who Jim Cummings, the voice of Pete, describes as not necessarily the villain of the film, but closely resembles the bully neighbor. But like Goofy, the writer Jim Megan was able to craft this version of Pete while also honoring the history of the character, who like Goofy featured in shots prior to the movie, and is also Disney's longest running continued Disney character, and debuted three years before Mickey Mouse in 1925's Alice Solves the Puzzle. He was actually voiced by Walt Disney himself for like the first four years, mostly grunts, but it set the foundation for the voice he uses today from Jim Cummings, who was the voice since 1992. Originally, Pete had always been the classic villain for Mickey and also had a wooden leg with a bear-like appearance. Side note, I didn't even know Pete was actually, um, he's actually a cat, but I guess the part that throws me off is his teeth. I used to think he was some type of weird dog, but that's besides the point. He was originally the fall for Mickey, then Donald, and then Goofy in 1935's Mickey's Service Station, where they interacted for the first time. The 1990s attempted to humanize Pete with a family and give him the suburban life, but this due from his villainous origins. Now drawing from this, Pete in the Goofy movie demonstrates the theme of parenting by showing a different type of parenting with his son PJ. I'm going to guess the reason why his wife Peg and his daughter Pistol weren't in the film was because it wouldn't be a direct comparison to Goofy and Max. We have Goofy and Max, then we have Pete and PJ, a direct comparison. Pete's approach to parenting is quite a fixed approach by being dominating and controlling, believing that he has to keep PJ under his thumb and discipline him in order to prevent PJ from drowning a gang. He is the one who recommends the idea of going on a camping trip in order to build a father-son relationship, but this doesn't exactly mean that PJ is enjoying it, and it could just be an excuse for Pete to say that he's done these trips with his child. 
We see PJ happiest when he's with Max all listening to Powerline. They saw parenting really depends on a child because the parent can claim they know their child better than themselves, but the child would actually know the parent in a way the parent wouldn't even realize. But the parent would still view themselves as a good parent because of their role as the provider. This gives space in the story for Goofy to either take Pete's advice and make the decisions for Max or go against Pete's advice and give Max more freedom in his choices about his own life and he ends up doing both. Goofy uses Pete's advice when he tells Max to go on fishing but obviously Goofy being involved means that it was bound to go wrong. But still it gives us one of the best treasures in film history. Look at him. Look at it. But on the other hand, Goofy also listens to his own parental intuition and gives the wheel quite literally to Max after they have their little small heart to heart and lets Max decide where they go on a trip on the open road. Just wanted to <laughs> put that in there anyway. But this is after Max had already changed the route to LA. But again, this moment highlights Goofy's trait of innocence and how he can unknowingly make innocent mistakes. Trust you wholeheartedly, son. To the open road. And from here, we get a very fun montage of the stark contrast of interest between Goofy and Max and how much Goofy doesn't enjoy the same things as Max. The juxtaposition. That's a GCSE English word, by the way. If you remember Rain S, you remember that word. The juxtaposition between this montage and everything Max has been through is brilliant, but it does not stop there. Goofy and Max are finally bonding better than they've done throughout the whole movie. And it's already been alluded to of a time when Goofy and Max did have fun when Max was a child. But their piece is interrupted by Pete, who can see Goofy and Max's healthier relationship and take some form of issue with it and then he tries to reinforce his parenting style to Goofy. And Goofy exposes the weaknesses of Pete's style of parenting while they're in the hot tub. As usual, he is stubborn and tells Goofy that PJ respects him, which is debatable, but this scene also shows Goofy's stubbornness in his support and trust in Max. We see this heated discussion with a scene enveloped in tranquil sea blues, and then a tranquil blue is then interrupted, even when Goofy tries not to listen to Pete's advice by the glove compartment, and this scene is blasted with strong orange hues, and Goofy finds out the truth. Literally no words, pure cinema. We then see the disappointment in Goofy's face when he enters the room and from this point we can see Goofy test Max on his final decision on the trip. There are actions and consequences in a Goofy movie and that is what drives the film, it is a character driven film. The main focus is the relationship between Goofy and Max and also the parenting styles are also evident throughout the examination of Goofy and Pete. Oh, Parental relationships where they only knew the style of parenting that was used on them during their upbringing. And then they thought they could transfer that style of parenting to their child, but it's a different context and a different environment in comparison to when they grew up. And Goofy eventually learns this through spending time with Max and doing things he enjoys. Max displays that this needs to be understood in order to understand his parent. And that's probably where Max and Goofy were able to grow their relationship. Obviously this is a film, but it shows an example of the ideal type of relationship a father should have with their sons and above that the relationship between a parent and child. In fact, this is discussed in a 25th anniversary interview. Bill Farmer, the voice of Goofy, based his performance and drew inspiration from his young son to give Goofy an emotional layer. And Kevin Lima, the director, his father actually left when he was 12 and he didn't see him for another 25 years. With this, he then transferred his feelings into this film and what he believed a father should be and his wants and needs through Goofy and Max. Now, you know I couldn't finish this video without mentioning the music. You know I couldn't do it. The musical numbers in this movie rival those of the well-known Disney Renaissance movies because of the amount of understanding of each of the characters and how they expose the characters' inner feelings and how they drive the movie. Like I won't go into as much detail as, you know, the one and only music analyst Sideways. Side note. Listen, he does incredible essays on music from film and musicals adapted to film, so please watch his stuff. Just trust me in that. If you're interested in music breakdowns, Sideways is the guy. Sideways. Now, back to the Goofy movie. The people responsible for the music are Bambi Mo, Jack Feldman, and David Z. Rivkin. Bambi and Jack were in charge of the score and musical numbers of the film, while David was in charge of the Powerline songs. Bambi and Jack approached the songwriting in the traditional Disney approach of understanding that songs are one of the most integral parts of the films and used the history of Goofy and Max to inform the songs and their lyrics. For example, the opening number gave me strong Grease vibes, and this is what we learned from it. The students are excited because it's the last day before summer, while we also learn about Max's thoughts and feelings towards Roxanne while also the feelings of being a teenager and the responsibilities that they have. Max is the main protagonist of the film, but then the song doubles as the I Want song and the world building, scene setting, opening song, instead of having separate songs like other Disney Renaissance movies. Plus on top of that, the various duets between Goofy and Max demonstrate their relationship and the stages in their relationship. Like on the open road, it emphasizes their distinct, differing views, but also demonstrates that they're basically singing at the same time, but slightly delayed. 
and this could be interpreted as how similar they actually are. But they don't see eye to eye yet, and we'll, we'll get to that. Do we know if this song takes place in the Disney world, or was it part of Goofy's imagination? Because he's the only one humming the song after it's ended. Or do we care? No! In this world, it makes sense because it's Goofy. Literally, it's a Goofy Disney world. Like in musicals, when people start singing randomly and somehow in unison, without ever meeting each other, ever seeing each other before, it makes sense because we know that this is not reality. In the real world, if someone started singing, then it's just funny to me. Like, I would laugh. I'll, I'll laugh. Look. I chew her. I'm fro. <laughs> Hallelujah. Another point is that they understood when to also not use music in order to serve the story because there's basically no musical number after their little trip to the possum park. It's a little fun jingle but it's not a fall in your face musical number. And without any musical number the viewers get to watch the relationship between Max and Goofy and how it becomes increasingly tense because they don't see eye to eye and Max withholding the truth from Goofy about the map. Now with all this emotional build up then comes one of the best love songs in the Disney catalog. A song that displays the understanding relationship between Goofy and Max after they laid their emotions bare. Like it's open. It's, it's beautiful. The openness of the lyrics, the distinct solos during their verses, but then the harmonies during the chorus. They both get time to shine and basically become one through song and acceptance. And Sideways highlights that if we weren't talking about the Goofy movie right now, it would just be describing the generic Disney love song. But this example switches the basis of the Disney love song and shows a different type of love between family. And in this case, father and son. It just slaps power line time. So again, the person responsible for the power line songs is David Z. Rifkin. The team wanted music that sounded like the music of the early 90s. And they, you know, they were reaching for the stars and they thought of Prince, but they knew that they wouldn't get Prince, so they got David instead. And David had actually worked with Prince on Purple Rain and other works after that. And Kevin Lima based power line on the popular artists of the time, like Prince, Michael Jackson, and Bobby Brown. Plus at the time, Powerline was actually voiced by Tevin Campbell, who was Prince's protege. And the animation for his performance was based on actual choreography, so that's why it looks like you can dance to it, because you can actually follow it. The songwriter is Roy Freeland and Patrick DeRima, when discussing the team's approach to writing the Powerline songs, said that, I remember they gave us a synopsis of what the scene would be about, what the conflict was, and what the characters were, so we could think about it thematically. So we had an idea that it was a father-son thing, and we wanted it to broaden out to be a romantic relationship thing too. The way people find each other. And that approach can be applied to all of the songs in the Goofy movie, but the incorporation of the pot songs are given an integral part of the story, and how they are used to express the feelings of his characters, like stand out. Powerline is someone who Max looks up to, and admires greatly, clearly demonstrated in the shots of Max's room. He's everywhere. Max wants to impress and talk to Roxanne, so he wants to get her attention and plans a performance of the greatest rock star on the planet. The song is called Stand Out. You know what I'm saying? It's called Stand Out. The lyrics match Max's intentions, but disguised as a pop song by Powerline. He's smooth. PJ and Bobby are backing him with special effects and pyrotechnics. The crowd is screaming, saying random things. There's crowd interaction. And what does that make him look like he has powers? Lastly, in terms of eye to eye, this acts as like a full stop in Goofy and Max's relationship of acceptance. It's about listening to each other, finally seeing each other for who they are as individuals and as a duo, and not letting each other down. Listen, it's brilliant. And the movie of A Goofy Movie serves the story and acts as a bridge between the 90s and Disney. While the Powerline songs can be played in public and stand out on their own as incredible songs in their own right. Ultimately, the Goofy Movie didn't do well at the box office. The movie didn't even premiere in California and instead debuted at Walt Disney World in 1995, a time in which Jeffrey Katzenberg, you remember get Jeffrey from, from the Prince of Egypt essay? He was no longer at Disney after the fallout with Michael Eisner. Drew Taylor from Vanity Fair in their report on a Goofy movie highlights the fact that the backing for a Goofy movie had essentially left and was merely a contractual obligation instead of the other widely promoted Disney products. This was also demonstrated in the published reaction to the film with its total box office earnings of Pocahontas' opening weekend. In fact, here's a review I found of a Goofy movie from 1995 by Lewis Black. He um, prefaced the review with the fact that he's only watching it for his son and that he hated Goofy as a child. This film, which actually should be titled Son of Goofy, turns out to be a new Goofy. 
As director Lima says, instead of just keeping Goofy one-dimensional as he's been in the past, we wanted to give him an emotional layer that would add to the emotional arc of the story. We wanted the audience to see his feelings instead of just his antics. He's talking about Goofy, Mickey's pal. The movie appears to have forgotten that it's an adolescent angst drama about his son Max's ambivalent feelings about having Goofy as a dad. Max feels like an unnoticed nerd at school, and in order to break out, he imitates Rockstar Powerline at a speech by the principal. This wins him all the other students' love and affection, but convinced Max is in the gang, Yuffie drags him on a cross-country trip, recreating one he took with his dad years ago. There are a few comic moments, but I'm hard-pressed to think of them. This is a story about a boy and a dad, and a boy and first love. What mental giant decided this was a goofy s- <laughs> What mental giant decided that this was a goofy story that needed to be made? It has no audience that I can think of. Boys old enough to be interested in romance don't go to Goofy cartoons, and children young enough to enjoy Goofy will find it too character-driven, plotted, and slow-paced. Instead, it is bland, a barely television-length cartoon stretched out to fill a feature and not much fun. Now, guys, before, don't don't start getting your pitchforks. Now, this isn't an attack. Ooh. This isn't an attack on Black's opinion on the movie because he's entitled to it. Yeah, he ultimately gave it a one out of five stars. But this piece of evidence is needed to understand the change in reaction towards the Goofy movie and how it's remembered today. There's been a clear change in how the film is perceived, and this was a gradual process after the film was released on home video. This is because of how the film's themes resonate with its audience and how incredible the soundtrack is, resulting in essays and videos similar to this one where people are expressing their admiration and love for what the Goofy movie means to them and their life like Brian Seeker, Nick and Nax, Manga Writer, 24 Frames of Nick and Sideways. This movie hits home for me because of the father-son tale and the um, power line encapsulating my favorite musicians growing up. I could relate to Max to a level and that's probably why this film sticks with me to this day because I can also think about how I want to be as a father to my kids and think about trust and coming to terms with the fact that they grow up and change. So to Kevin Lima and the Goofy Movie team, I applaud you. We applaud you, okay? Thank you for this treasure of excellence. And um, yeah, this is a gem and happy 26th anniversary.